This episode of the Productivity S podcast is brought to you by Gusto. What is Gusto? Well, it rhymes with musto or rusto, as in let's do it once more with Gusto. But Gusto is also easy online payroll, benefits, and HR built for modern small businesses. To get three months for free when you run your first payroll, visit gusto.com slash timecrafting. I'll have more about Gusto during this episode, but for now, let's get on with the show. Welcome to the Productivity is Podcast. I am your host, Mike Vardy, and this week on the show, I'm excited to welcome Josh Kaufman. He is the author of How to Fight a Hydra, Face Your Fears, Pursue Your Ambitions, and Become the Hero You Are Destined to Be. I've been a big fan of Josh's work for a while. I'm surprised I haven't had him on the show to this point already. He wrote the personal MBA the first 20 hours. We dive into the differences between this new book of his and the books he's written in the past, The Power of Parable, uh, you know, what I loved about this book, so much in there. It's a nice, tiny little book. Uh, it, it's something you could bring in your pocket and take it with you everywhere. And uh, there's such great lessons in here. So we talk about the power of story, so many things, why he is a productivity expert, which is something I never really thought about when it comes to Josh Kaufman, and so much more. So let's get into the conversation, this, I guess, seven-headed conversation uh, with Josh Kaufman, the author of How to Fight a Hydra, here on the Productivityist Podcast. I'd like to welcome Josh Kaufman to the Productivity as Podcast. Josh, thanks for joining me. Mike, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. You know, I, I don't know why I haven't had you on the show before. We've crossed paths many times. Um, my only reason for n- maybe not having you on the show up until this point is because I still have a, uh, if I pull away, a fairly fresh copy of the personal MBA Master of the Art of Business, <laughs> fairly been, which I should have read seven years ago, <laughs> but I'm just going through as I'm learning now. Uh, you know, it's one of those things where there's so many great people that you can talk to. And I've again, because we've crossed paths on several occasions, it's almost like, oh yeah, right. I haven't had you on the show yet. So it's good to have you here. It's great to be here. And it's never too late. Uh, no, it, <laughs> no, it, no, it's never too late. I want to, I want to talk about your, your, your book because you know, I mean, we've ta- you know, you've got the personal MBA and you got the first 20 hours, right? Like that. And then you've got how to fight a Hydra. Now, which of those things is not like the other? Uh, this one was a bit of a departure for me. <laughs> a, a fun but, one. It, yeah, but it, but not terribly so, because I think that that what I, what I'm I'm a big fan of of the parable and the fable kind of stories um because I think that there's a lot that you can glean from going into this book when I read it and I actually listened to the audio version of it I had a sense of what I was I went in with that mindset right which I think is is helpful if if you you're kind of primed for it I mean you've got the the alchemist you've got uh you know the go giver mm-hmm. you've got oh gosh uh, uh even you can even go so far as to say the legend of bagger vance to a certain degree right, right. by Stephen Pulkin. um What led you down this path of saying, I'm going to present uh, life lessons and and, and business lessons inside of this fable based on the, uh, you know, uh, an adventurous pursuit uh, to fight a Hydra? So the the long story of of Hydra is is very relevant to the the topic of this podcast. Uh, Hydra actually started as a productivity book. And one of the things that I noticed, I, I worked on that book for about a year. And it, the the focus was very much, um, or I was attempting to do the same thing that I did in personal MBA. Like, let's take all of the most important things to know about business, uh, boil them down, distill them to the essence, put them in a single book that someone who's new to this can just pick up and learn all the most important things quickly. So that was the intent. And I, I worked on that book for a year and and the manuscript just wasn't working and I couldn't figure out why? And so I had a lot of conversations uh, with the the various folks who uh, read early copies of my work and, and edit. And I started r- really trying to get to the core of why do people follow productivity materials in the first place? Like, wh- why why is this a big thing that people are interested in and need more of in their life? And I was thinking back to the conversations that I had with readers uh, of both personal MBA and first 20 hours. And so for personal MBA readers, uh, a lot of those conversations were along the lines of, I have a new business idea, but 
I'm not sure if it's going to work. Can you please tell me it's going to work, that this is going to be a good use of my time? And the same thing with first 20 hours is I want to learn something new, but I'm not sure if I can. I'm not sure if I have the what it takes to get as good as I want to be. Can you please provide me some assurance that spending my time in this way is going to be beneficial for me and that I'm going to be able to get what I want from it? And so there, there's this this universal undercurrent of uncertainty and mm-hmm. anxiety and fear of the unknown. Like, I'm afraid I'm going to invest a lot of myself into something that is not going to work and I'm going to feel really bad about that. And so I really start ex- started exploring these topics um, as a thing in and of itself. Like if you're if you're trying to achieve something big in your life, no matter what that is, you're always going to have to deal with that uncertainty and anxiety and fear of the unknown. And so it's it's beneficial for us to to both look at that squarely to understand what the challenge is and how to face it. And then learn some ways to approach those universal challenges in, in a way that helps us, you know, step up and, and actually go after the things that we want in our life. So, and, and what you're saying is, is definitely something that I run across all the time. People are, you know, both the fear of what if I don't do this, but the fear of what if I do, right? You know, yeah. so if someone reads a productivity and there, you're right, there's a slew of productivity books. I mean, the term productivity porn is pervasive on the internet, right? Like there are so many different ways that you could tackle tasks, take on projects and, you know, goal set. And, and I mean, if you spend all, well, I mean, we both spent lots of time in those spaces looking at every nook and cranny of it on the internet. Um, what, when I, when we started this conversation, just before we started recording, uh, you know, the, the term productivity expert came up and I've, it's interesting because I've always thought of you as more of a, a business entrepreneurial expert or, or you know, uh, a, a, a person that knows a lot about that stuff. But productivity wasn't a thing that I necessarily said, you know, Josh Kaufman, he's a productivity guy. You should go check out his work. Sure. Uh, what was the, was the first 20 hours kind of like that first really real foray into it, like into a deeper dive? Because personal MBA obviously is a broad, like you said, it covers a lot of stuff. It's broad strokes. And the first 20 hours dives in a little bit deeper. This Hydra seems to dive in uh, in a completely different way uh, in terms of, you know, making sure you're, you're, you're understanding the moves that you're making and why you're, what you're going to face along the way. Is, is that how your journey to being a productivity expert has kind of come? And, and was that your intent to say, hey, you know what, now I'm, I've, I've gone down this path a little bit more than, say, the path that maybe the personal MBA was initially setting you off on in the first place. Yeah, I I think the overarching theme of my work in general uh, is probably best uh, described as as practical wisdom. Like, Mm. how do we understand what we're trying to do, uh, why we're trying to do it, what we want out of it, and uh, really think about the approaches that we're taking to the work and figuring out if, if the approach we're currently considering or taking is actually the best way to get what we want. And so there are undercurrents of, of those things in personal MBA. You know, if you, want, if you want to start a business, here's how you can understand it in a, a much more um, clear and sophisticated way what a business is, how it works, what you need to do, what you don't need to do, or, or distra- distractions from what you want. Um, and, and by improving your understanding of this thing you're trying to do, you can make much better decisions and get much better results. Um, I think that's a productivity topic. You know, same thing with first 20 hours. You know, what is the skill that you're trying to pick up? What do you want to be able to do that you're not able to do right now? What does that look like when you've reached that skill level? And then how can you go about the process of learning and research and practice and um, figuring out how to get the help you need How can you do that in a way that gets you from knowing absolutely nothing to being really, really good in as little time as possible? And that's a productivity topic. So um, I think of Hydra in the same terms, only it really gets more to the root of whatever it is you want to do. Like, what do you value? What are you pursuing? Why are you pursuing that? And why is it important to you? And then all of the barriers that uh, that are in your way, you know, maybe it's uh, you have to learn how to do something new. Maybe you have to figure out um, some very complex and scary uh, 
problem that's that's that you're currently facing. Um, and, and maybe some of the things that you have to confront are not out there in the world, but are inside your mind. And, and the the hesitation and the fear and the, the emotional difficulty of going after something big and potentially doing that for a very long time. So I I think of all of those ideas in, in a very broad sense as productivity topics. All right, we're going to take a break from the proceedings to talk about our sponsor for this episode, Gusto. Gusto offers payroll benefits and HR for modern small businesses. It's fast, easy to run payroll, which includes W-2s and 1099s. Expert HR support is just a call away. There's health benefits, 401ks, and more for nearly any budget. Gusto also automatically files and pays all state, local, and federal payroll taxes. You can sign, store, and organize employee documents all online and choose from hundreds of benefit plans to fit nearly any budget. You got a tough question? You get direct access to certified HR professionals, and Gusto partners with small businesses across all 50 states. But you don't want to wait. For better payroll in 2019, which is just around the corner, get started now. Listeners to this podcast get three months for free once they run their first payroll. All you need to do is go to gusto.com slash timecrafting. That's gusto.com slash timecrafting. I'd like to thank Gusto for sponsoring this episode of the Productivity is Podcast. And now let's get back to the proceedings. So let's get back to the creation of the new book of the book, how, how to fight a Hydra. So, so what you're working on this book for a year, it's not the book. When was, was there a specific moment where you either maybe a piece of, uh, of literature inspired you or um, maybe some, some, some piece that kind of hit you out of nowhere that said, you know, this book needs to be rooted more in, let's say metaphor uh, so that it, a has maybe that timelessness to it that Ryan Holiday talks about, right? Where you can, because mm-hmm. I could, I can picture myself picking this book up again and again. I've picked, I've read like The Go Giver several times. I can actually remember listening to The Go Giver, and I think I've talked about this once before. And I was doing the dishes, and there was a part where I could see the end coming, and I started to well up a bit because mm-hmm. it, it was one of those moments where I'm like, oh, this is what this. And reading The Alchemist again, same thing. Didn't quite well up, but you know, reading it, it there, there's value there because there's pieces that you either didn't pick up when you first read it or that you didn't need at that time where you're not necessarily, at least in my mind, not necessarily going to get that from a straightforward productivity book or business book or whatever. So what was that moment where you said, you know, this, this book doesn't need to be this instead, I'm going to go down this path and see where, where, you know, this is what this book needs to be. Yeah. I'll, I'll, there were three primary influences and and I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. I think the the big thing that I started thinking of when it's like, okay, I'm, I'm going to write about, uncertainty and risk and fear of the unknown is that, you know, my my classic approach to writing is research based nonfiction. And uh, turns out that writing research based nonfiction about uncertainty and risk and fear of the unknown is uh, a great way to write a book that nobody wants to read because it's super uncomfortable. Um, so part of the difficulty of this topic is, you know, the, the it's emotionally loaded. Like we all have things that we want to do that we're we're scared to pursue or concerned about our ability to to be able to pull it off. And so, I really started thinking early on, if I'm going to do this, I have to do it in a completely different way because the way I'm used to approaching these topics just isn't going to work for this one. And so, uh, the the first primary influence uh, was the War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. And lo- uh, wonderful book, uh, just like you mentioned, it's a book I've I've read five or six times. And, um, th- you know, one of the things that Stephen does extremely well is take this this bundle of doubt and emotions and and blocks and hesitations. And he essentially makes it an entity that is outside of yourself. Uh, he calls it the resistance. And uh, I, I think uh, he he describes it as a malevolent force of nature that is trying to desperately to get you to not do the thing that you want to do. And so I thought that was a really interesting uh, way, approach to being able to talk about this cluster of issues as a thing, an entity, something that you need to address. And I had read a couple years prior, there's a a great book uh, called Metaphors We Live By, uh, by I think it's Mark Lakoff and uh, Mark Johnson. and the the upshot of that book is that the metaphors that we use to think about the world around us 
uh, substantially influence how we think about the world, how we approach the world, and how we act on on a day to day, minute to minute basis. And the the best uh, I, the best most memorable example from the book is um, they say if you think of argument as war, you're going to approach a conversation as uh, in a very substantial way. If you think of argument as a dance or a conversation as a dance, uh, the that interaction is going to look very different. And and the only difference is mental. It's it's how you are thinking of how you are conceptualizing this thing that you are, in, are engaged in. And so um, Hydra came about by uh, essentially combining those two ideas. It's, you know, what if this, you know, the, the crazy, big, ambitious, scary projects that we're trying to pursue, like what, what if we treat that as some sort of entity that's easy to visualize, um, something that um, is complex by nature and any right-minded person would uh, be very hesitant to, to approach in the first place? Mm -hmm. And so uh, I am a, a big fan of, of both uh, mythology and fantasy. Uh, so I actually, I have an active Dungeons Dragons group that we've been going for about a year now. Uh, so this, this is the, the storiness is something that I really enjoy and is a big part of my life. And so uh, the, the image of a Hydra uh, just popped immediately to mind as, as something, you know, a big, scary, complex uh, monster that if you're going to defeat it, you're going to have to, to approach it in a very specific way. So and, yeah, we're, I'm, I'm actually doing Dungeons and Dragons right now. Fantastic. <laughs> a bunch of us get together. So I'm a rogue. I think I'm, no, I'm a thief now. I'm, I moved up to level four. We've only started, up to, but it's one of those things where we found a way to get together. And, and yeah, there's, there's a, you, you can immerse yourself. And I was a big, I remember playing Bard's Tale. Oh, so fun. 99 Berserkers, 99 Berserkers. 99. And that was, that was a great example of, uh, you know, and, and for anyone who's played that game, I'll link to it. So, I mean, because I think you can get it on, on iOS now. But, um, or yeah, I think, it, it, anyway, you can play it. Uh, there was a point where there was this, this group of Berserkers that you had to face before you could get to the, the final boss. Uh, but as you're going into the catacombs or something like that. And I would constantly try to beat those guys, but there you, you would, you try different tactics to try to do it. And eventually you just had to go, you had to keep making yourself more powerful as well as try different strategies to do it. And and I think that when you, in this book, uh, you've got the same, I mean, that comes up again and again, you know, the, the, you, you, it's not like you can slay the Hydra in one fell swoop, right? Yeah. Yeah, and, and and you may need to improve substantially in a great many areas to be able to do the thing that you want to do. And that's just it's it's part of the expected difficulty of the adventure that you've chose to to go on. And I, I think reframing this the whatever this big ambitious project that you're you're trying to pursue as an adventure, as as something, you know, that requires some exploration, that requires training, that requires um, experimentation, trying different things and seeing what works. I, I think approaching these big life goal things as an adventure is a very, uh, a very useful way of framing and setting your own expectations on what, what the entire journey is going to look like. I think that metaphor also does something that, that can really help people, uh, attack things like this is it humanizes them, right? Totally. It makes it, it, I think one of the things that happens with a lot of things when we look at them, we tend to overcomplicate them. We tend mm -hmm. to, you know, we, we get, get in our own way. But when you, when you add story, when you add, you know, this idea of, and of course the hero's journey comes up in this as well. I mean, it, the funny thing is, is I, as, as the book progresses and if you're, if you, when you get the book and you should, and the audio book is, is great. Um, you know, uh, Josh reads it, uh, there's a few accents that you pull off in there. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. Um, and, and it, it reminded me a bit of, um, and again, there's another great book. It, we're seeing more of these rules for a night by Ethan Hawke, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. Uh, you know, we're, I think in a world that is so um, moves at such a great pace and is very rooted in, you know, these things that are, that are so tangible and yet, and yet can become so overwhelming. I think books like this and stories like this that kind of as I'm listening to it and as I'm reading it, 
you know, you go, oh, I see what you did there. Oh, I see what you did there. And by the way, for me, the hydro wasn't necessarily a project. It was my entire business. Love like, that's it. the way that's I great. at it first, right? So that's the other thing about metaphor. You get to personalize it, right? That That is one of the most fascinating things about this entire project. Uh, it, it, people read themselves into the story. And, mm-hmm. you know, I've, I've had responses um, from some of the early readers of, of the book that are all across the spectrum in, in ways that I had no idea um, that, that it would apply to. Uh, so, so I had a friend who read the book and, and he said, uh, this book is about the process of overcoming addiction. It's like, wow. I didn't intend it for it to be that, but if that is, if that is something that you can read and get value out of it, that's great. Uh, my 90 year old uh, grandmother read the book and she's like, this, this book is about getting old. Like I didn't intend that either, but that's really cool. And and that's the the neat thing about metaphor and the neat thing about fiction, particularly, you know, this this type of fiction that has research and uh, con- conceptual backing is that it can apply to to all sorts of different circumstances that uh, I didn't anticipate. But if people find value there, I, I'm absolutely all for it. My son was hearing me listen to the book last night because uh, I had it on my speaker uh, in, in my bedroom. And he he heard the term Hydra, and he's eight, so he has a sense of this stuff now. He plays you know plays Lego video games. He's got Minecraft on the brain. In fact, it's one of the reasons why time crafting kind of came to be the methodology oh, nice. I teach. It. Kind of we you know when you're when you're uh, again that abstract comes in where where one of the things you're supposed to talk to your kids about is not how was your day at school? Cause you're going to get fine or it was okay or whatever. So you ask them about things that are going to engage them. And I asked him, well, how do you, what's Minecraft? Like, could you explain Minecraft to me? And he said, it's about taking different parts and I'm simplifying it, but taking different like raw elements and combining them together to make something amazing, like something cool. And I'm like, Oh, that's, you know, I thought about it from my own vantage point. And I thought, well, that's, you know, you take the calendar, you take the to-do list, you take all these things, you put them together. You have a wonderful life. That's time. Oh, time crafting. And all of a sudden, boom, that was it. How, 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 now that you've got this book out there, are you still, I mean, and obviously when you're so immersed in things, you were able to piece these abstract thoughts together because this book would not exist if you, <laughs> in its form if you weren't able to do that because there are lesson upon lesson upon lesson. And it's not like it's o- overbearing. It, it, you're not like, it's not like you're getting hit jab, 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 jab. It's, it's, they, they land. And like I said before, you can come back to the book later and go, oh, I missed that before. Or, oh, this means something different to me now. Mm-hmm. Are you going to be exploring stuff like this in, in your writing down the road? I mean, because you've got like, this is a, like we said, a different kind of book for you. Or is this kind of, was this an experiment that you kind of want to leave and see how it, how it plays? And then maybe like as a writer, you're going to look at other things or how does this play into the whole, uh, you know, uh, body of work that you're putting together? Yeah. So it's, it's really interesting. I, the very last thing that I anticipated doing this year uh, when I started the project was was writing a, a fictional book. Mm-hmm. And so uh, it's very much an experiment. It's an experiment that I really enjoyed. I think I, I enjoyed writing this book uh, far more than than either Personal MBA or, or First 20 Hours. Um, I have often uh, envied fiction writers for, you know, if they get stuck or don't know what to do next, they can just make something up. <laughs> and so it was really nice to be able to do that. Um, or, or you know, spend a lot of of mental bandwidth trying to construct a situation that would illustrate the things that I wanted to illustrate. And you know, it's it's a very different way of of learning material. So, you know, a, a lot of nonfiction is recommendation based. You know, here's what the research says. This is what you should do. This is how you should go about doing it. This way is the best way. And anecdotal stuff. Yeah, I mean, pe- people stories. fill in. I mean, you and I both know that there are books out there, really great books and books that are not so good that you, you can go, OK, there we don't need as much anecdotal stuff in there. And a lot of it's there just to fill in, in some cases to either support what's already been said or frankly, to fill fill pages. Totally. Right? You know, so you get away from that when you write fiction. Yeah. And, and I think it's, it's a fundamentally different way of learning when the, the process by which you're learning useful things is you're watching someone in a difficult situation and you're seeing them deal with that difficult situation in a very skillful way. Uh, There's, there's a lot of, you know, it's, it's more broadly applicable, like we were talking about earlier, but even just, you know, watching somebody do something is a different way of learning. And so I, that's the part of Hydra that I, I really like as, as a way of, of illustrating these, you know, 
sometimes very old philosophical concepts and sometimes these very new, very modern, here's how you approach a complex situation uh, concepts. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I don't know if if I am going to plan to write more like this in the future. Um, th- this is probably the the most woo woo belief that I that I have in my brain. Um, I think it's important when you're writing a book to try to listen or intuit what the book wants to be. Mm. And I, I don't know if that makes sense, but no, it make, as a writer, it makes sense. Yeah. I, like, I, it makes sense to me, but I, I, again, audience, like maybe not so much, but to me, so go ahead and, and dive in a bit deeper. Yeah. So a good example is, is personal MBA where I did tenfold diff, substantially different drafts of that book. And it wasn't until that I, I hit the structure that ended up being the final. It's like, yes, this is this is what this work needs to be to do what I want it to do. Um, the same thing happened with First 20 Hours and, and Hydra was very much this. And so mm-hmm. um, one of the, the big both uh, influences and, and models for the book is Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. Yeah. And it's it's I'm great looking at that book across from my I'm from my viewpoint right now, I can see it on my bookshelf. It's it stands such, out amongst a bunch of other ones. Such a great yeah. book. I love it. And, and you know, I love it in in terms of like, it, it it's very applicable to the themes in Hydra because, you know, here's the most powerful person in the world who is dealing with the same stuff that we're dealing with on a day-to-day basis. Like if, mm-hmm. if, there's, if there's ever proof that this stuff is never going to go away, you're always going to have to deal with it. Reading that book is is a really great reminder of that. But um, the the form of meditations um, for for listeners who aren't familiar, um, it's essentially uh, Marcus Aurelius was the emperor of Rome and he was keeping a journal and he was just writing notes to himself. And so um, there's there's a uh, great tradition in uh, fiction and literature of of what are called epistolary novels. So the story takes place um, with people writing letters back and forth. So uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula is a really great example of that. So uh, in the nonfiction world, uh, meditations is essentially self-epistolary. It's it's Marcus Aurelius writing notes to himself about what he's learning, what he's struggling with, what he wants to do, uh, what's he want, what he wants to focus on. And so as a narrative device, that actually worked really well for Hydra because, you know, it, it, the risk of doing fiction uh, particularly uh, fiction with a research base, is you can kind of get too into the fiction bit, um, too much description, too many characters, too much dialogue. And and that can really detract from, you know, the reader taking away the lessons that, that you hope that they'll take away. And so once I found that, you know, that that self-epistolary narrative device, so a, a an adventurer writing notes to themselves as they're tr- they're in the process of doing something hard and describing what they're going through. Um, the, the whole book just came together in, in a really beautiful way. You know, as you're mentioning this, one of the things I started thinking about is I've been reading uh, Jason Cockey's blog for a long time. Mm-hmm. The two blogs I read, well, three, but two that I really read, uh, Austin Cleon, who I just... <laughs> It, the, it's i love his stuff yeah as well as as well as jason cocky and seth godin as well those ones i mean they're daily pretty much so but jason recently uh you know as we're recording this has been sharing uh children's editions of well-known books so for example stephen johnson's how we got to now but mm-hmm. for, written for children and as you were mentioning like the less descriptive stuff and kind of getting to the uh almost not getting to the point i'll use that as as the phrasing just to you know simplify it but this idea that you know, we tend to get caught up in the flowery elements uh, rather than the, Hey, here's, here's the meat of the issue. Here's the meat of the the story. Um, I'm looking at, uh, I think about that. And then I'm looking at my bookshelf right now and I'm seeing books like, again, the obstacle is the way, uh, I look at, uh, ignore everybody. I look at, uh, Derek Sivers, uh, uh, what's the, uh, uh, anything you want. Um, again, Pressfield's war of art, The, the, some of the best books that I've read, that are helping you not just in work, but in life are short. Yeah. Lesson based. I mean, yes, I have, you know, some Robert green stuff. I have, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the organized mind. I do have bigger books, but those books are ones that I, 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 I can't sit do in one sitting number one, but also they, because they're so meaty and heavy that it's harder for me to kind of grab onto them or gravitate them as much as these other books. 
And I think with, I, I would imagine that that's the, well, that's what's going to happen with Hydra. I mean, I mean, I can already think about, number one, my son will probably want to hear it and listen to it. Because I said, hey, do you want me to play it for you one night before you're going to bed? And he goes, yeah. And the great thing about it is that he'll, those lessons will seep in uh, in ways that they won't seep in for me because he's eight and I'm right. 44, yeah. <laughs> right? Totally. So I, I think that there's some value in those those stories that are short, uh, are, are um, met, they can be metaphorical, but the, the idea is that instead of trying to be more than what it needs to be, just like you said, the book what is what it wants to be. Let that book be that and maybe don't get so obsessed with, you know, uh, I've got to get 300 pages, it's got to be 50,000 words, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I, I'm so glad to hear that. And and that is kind of echoed by a lot of the the things that I've heard from the the first readers of the book is I, I think that there's an enormous people attached an enormous amount of guilt to starting a book and not being able to finish it. Mm-hmm. And and the length of the book is is a direct influence in that, you know, so people has have less discretionary time. And, uh, you know, I, th- I think reading books is one of the highest value activities that you can have in your day. And so, you know, I've been trying to figure out uh, my my approach to the work is is always, you know, let's take an enormous amount of information, figure out the the absolute most important things that that make the biggest difference. And let's just talk about that stuff. And so that's one of the things that I think is going to, to directly carry over into future work is very concise, uh, short, uh, di- universal descriptions of important things. I mean, that's that's a, a, a theme that I definitely want to continue through through my next several books. Well, I'm looking forward to the Choose Your Own Adventure book that you're going to write. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the personal MBA, you know, the series of, you know, like, uh, will he be an accountant or will he be a entrepreneur? Let's see which would uh, it, 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 <laughs> I remember what was the other book? Remember the ones that were uh, they had green spines and where they fight for fantasy or where you had to roll dice. Do you remember those books? I just talked to a friend who is doing one of those right now and they're, they're still being printed. I don't remember the name of the series, but it's so fun. So much fun. Yeah, they, I remember because you had to have dice like it was it was like a step up of choose your own adventure. Yeah, choose your, I remember. And actually. One of the things that I've done with and, and and to show that I've been a writer for a really long time, uh, I have from when I was in grade, I think it was grade seven, uh, a, a book that was inspired largely by Douglas Adams's work. It was called Tiny Adventures at the Local Malt Shop. And it's a novella. It's really short. Uh, and it's, you know, written by someone in grade seven. So keep that in mind. Uh, <laughs> with, with a lot of humor trying to come in from places really inspired by Douglas Adams. But one of the books I wrote really early on was a was a choose your own adventure book called The Last Delta or the Delta the, something the Delta. And I have it. I still have it. I illustrated it. It's in a duo tang. And it's from it would have been from like the 80s. And I shared it with my son and, and he read it. And it was like, funny story is that the villain in it, who very Darth Maul or a very uh, sorry, Kylo Ren mask thing going on. So uh, but but, uh, you know, I think that that for anyone that that is trying to get a message out uh, and it's not landing uh, or it it seems complicated, I think looking I mean, even the front nine to a degree when I wrote the front nine, I mean, I used golf as a metaphor. Shouldn't have, I don't think, because I don't golf. But nonetheless, there was trying to teach lessons through metaphor. You've done it really, really well with this book. And it's I have to commend you for it. So um, where can people get the book right now? Uh, so that they can, uh, you know, at either uh, you know, just dive into it uh, and and take the lessons that you're trying to teach in it. Yeah. So the the best place to find information on the book is uh, the website howtofightahydra.com, and there are links to the the print ebook and audio editions all over the world. And so no matter where you are, it should be available. Um, and then if you want more information on my work in general, the best place to go is joshkaufman.net. Thanks for joining me today, Josh. Mike, it's an absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me on. And that's how the interview went down. There's no story or fable or parable behind it. It was a great conversation. I'm really, really pleased that I was able to get Josh to to be on the show. And I look forward to having him on the show again in the future. How to Fight a Hydra, a great read, short read, 
Uh, the audiobook is fantastic. All the links in that are in the show notes. Of course, if you want to get the show notes, go to productivityist.transistor.fm slash 221, and that will give you everything that you need to know. Now, if you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe because you don't want to miss future episodes. We've got a lot of great guests lined up for weeks and weeks and weeks. So you don't want to miss anything. And you can do that wherever you're listening to podcasts. And if you really like this show, like really liked it, then rate it. And better still, review it to give us context. Because then my producer, John Polster, and I can look at these ratings and reviews and go, hey, what's the feedback look like? How can we make the show better? What do we need to keep doing? That kind of thing. Plus, also, it helps people find the show as well. And this show, uh, this episode in particular, I really, really enjoyed. I mean, I want more people to get this book because I'm a big believer in the, the power of story, especially parable when it comes to this kind of thing. And there's a lot that can be taken from Josh's book here as well as his past work as well. So big thanks to Josh for joining me. Big thanks to John for producing the show. Big thanks to you for listening. Thanks to Gusto for sponsoring this episode of the show. And again, if you want to get three months for free once you run your first payroll, go Go to gusto.com slash timecrafting right now and make that happen. 2019 will soon be upon us. There's no better time than the present to make that happen. Again, gusto.com slash timecrafting. You'll get your three months for free when you run your first payroll. Gusto.com slash timecrafting. That's it for this episode. I'm Mike Vardy, the host of the Productivity Podcast, reminding you to stop guessing and start going. I'll see you later.